But just to kick things off, my name is Dan McGaugh. I'm the CEO founder of F and Amazing. Uh, we are a marketing technology and marketing analytics consulting company. We help a lot of companies pick out the tools they need to use, implement them and integrate them all together. And then ultimately help them turn all of that new data they have into a bunch of great reporting, as well as marketing automation, personalization and CRM. I've been in the space though for over 20 years. I have a long history of experience as an entrepreneur. Some people recognize me though from when I was the head of marketing at Kiss Metrics, where I actually succeeded, succeeded uh, Neil Patel. I took over uh, at the helm for him. And then as well as a lot of people know me from when I was the head of growth at codeschool.com before I got them uh, acquired by Pluralsight. But I'm really excited today. Uh, basically, uh, I have a, a good friend of mine today that's here with us today, Greg Brunk from a company called MetaRouter. And MetaRouter is a really, really awesome tool. It basically enables you to build your customer data infrastructure gives you one integration point, and then enables you to be able to send that data to many other tools. Uh, and Greg is the head of product there. Um, I know his brother, I know his sister-in-law, so it's definitely kind of a, a friend affair here, so a lot of cool stuff. But Greg, I'm probably butchering your introduction, so I'll let you <laughs> kind of do that there. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. This is a, this is a fascinating... Oh, am I muted? There we go. Feels like a cool topical time to be talking about this kind of stuff, just with everything that's changing with the industry and not just with COVID-19 and the economic downturn, but with, you know, compliance and regulation and consumer privacy stuff that's happening. I really think that empires in this space are built uh, at the bottom of these downturns. So it's a cool time to be strategic. It's cool to be talking about this. And uh, yeah, as, as Dan mentioned, I'm the, the head of product at MetaRouter. I've spent most of my career working in product leadership at companies that are focused on data infrastructure problems. Um, and I really geek out about this multi $100 billion industry and the 10,000 players in it that are trying to collaborate over these tiny little bite-sized pieces of information that are so important with how they all collaborate and how they get things done and how they deliver ROI. And so that's really the space where MetaRouter plays. We really focus on giving customers uh, the ability to really own the data uh, and have total transparency and insight into the data as it's collected before it goes out to any of these third parties so you can maximize your flexibility and ROI and security and compliance and, and we really try to play in that space. So it feels topical. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I know we're excited to have you as well and I'm a big fan of what you guys do and I think uh, if anybody is is aware of the 10,000 tools that are out there, it's definitely you guys. You guys have to play nicely with as many of them as you possibly can. Now, if I'm not mistaken, um, did you work at Astronomer as well? I did, yeah. I was um, an engineer at Astronomer and worked mainly on the sort of the user experience and the, uh, the integration team. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I didn't know. Yep. So, well, thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to being able to collaborate with you on this webinar and be able to kind of run through some stuff. So, but just to kind of kick things off, one thing we'd love to give everybody an opportunity to do is uh, we would like to take the opportunity to do basically a MarTech action plan with you, uh, basically help you build out a stack. Uh, we have a stack builder on our website where we can actually help you build your stack, go through the process of connecting all the things together to understand where they connect. You'll notice in the deep center of that, of course, is MetaRouter, which is one of the key parts of our infrastructure in making sure that we can pass all that data. As part of that action plan meeting, we're ultimately going to look at areas where you'll be able to cut costs in your MarTech stack, see if there's anything that's redundant. We have clients that we've saved thousands of dollars a month by basically just removing one of their products. Uh, we also will be able to talk about anything that you need to do in your stack to prepare you for an upcoming strategy, do a complete inventory of all of your tools, help you understand the cost of all that stuff and what cost you should probably be cutting. We'll also help you understand, like I mentioned, that data flow and how things are flowing all the way through. And then as well as give you ultimately some expert opinions on how you can get that stuff done. All you have to do is visit fandamazing.com slash martech plan. And you'll be able to schedule its time with us. And we'd love to show you how to build your stack with our new product that's on our website. But with that, we're not here to talk about that right now. So I do want to jump right into the webinar, the content. We have a lot of stuff to go through. Uh, so I definitely want to make sure that we can hit it all. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how you can ultimately th thrive, not just survive in this stack apocalypse. And I want to make sure that we lay the foundation for you to understand what that really means and what the stack apocalypse ultimately is. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, as everybody's probably aware in this, MarTech has been growing like crazy. The stack is getting absolutely huge. If we fast forward, or excuse me, if we rewind a little bit back to 2011, there was only about 150 different marketing tools out there, maybe 200. And then we fast forward to 2013, there was maybe 350, 2014, 
almost 3x growth, right? It got up to over a thousand different marketing technology tools. And I really appreciate Scott Brinker from Chief Martech putting these graphs together. They're really, really helpful. We have some friends who do the ones for Europe and the Netherlands and stuff like that. Always really, really cool. And it's just, it's crazy because by the time you get to 2015, you're over 2000, 2016, over 3,500. And the tools just don't stop growing. I mean, so much so that this last year, 2019, they practically just couldn't track them all. There was over 7,000 different MarTech tools. And they basically said, listen, there's so many tools out there that are now becoming the tools inside of the other tool that's inside this other tool that it's becoming really, really hard to track it. And for 2020, they've actually open sourced the project. So anybody can actually submit their tool to it and anybody can get that on there, which for me is practically awesome, but also terrifying because who knows what the hell is going to be inside that stack. But with all this said, with that amount of growth, you can just kind of take in a big picture that we're in a bubble. I mean, in 2019, there was over $100 billion invested into just marketing technology. Like the industry is just massive at this point. And with 7,000 different tools, not everybody's going to survive. Now, obviously, we can notice from 2018, there were 6,800 tools. And then to 2019, there were 7,040 tools. So really, that growth kind of plateaued. And one of the things that was predicted by Gartner is that we're about to go into the age of reckoning. So if we look at this simple graph, basically in software, you typically have ups and downs, ups and downs. And what happens is, is that basically you get to these little kind of peaks of what's going on. And then ultimately there won't be enough business or there's a bunch of consolidation and things happen. And in the past five years, MarTech has really just been blowing up and going crazy. Now this document came out, or this graph came out in early 2019, and basically everybody in the industry kind of agreed, we're headed a little bit down, there's not as much uh, going on, companies are getting consolidated, of course, Adobe bought a bunch of companies, Salesforce bought a bunch of companies, I mean, Google bought uh, a bunch of companies, they bought Looker, so like, it definitely was going into this consolidation phase, and that's what we were all looking at. However, now if you time this, right, basically with 2020, now we have this pandemic on our hand and there's no longer going to be that much M&A. People are trying to keep onto their cash. So we're not really sure when this is gonna go back up. And I'm not sure about you, but like when I think about the current situation that's going on right now, I mean, New York is practically underwater, right? And we're all standing out here in our other states, like, hey, whatever, everything's fine. But really the stack is an area where you're gonna see a lot of turmoil. And you're going to see a lot of different things change. And you're going to see a lot of companies implode. Um, we have multiple people that we are aware of that are in the MarTech space that we all know on a first name basis that are losing their minds because their entire business, which was based on travel, which was based on hotels or based on restaurants, they're imploding. They literally are laying off everybody. As an example, Lola.com, which is not a MarTech company, they're a travel services business. They laid off a ton of people. I mean, just a year ago, they signed a billion dollar deal with Amex, right? And now they're basically laying off most of their staff because, because the travel industry is gone, so is their business. And you have to think about it. We all think about MarTech just as like that marketing automation tool we have. But there's a lot of marketing technology tools which are specific to restaurants or specific to hotels or specific to a, a conference venue. And they're all either trying to pivot trying to figure it out and also saying, oh, I was going to raise a round. I mean, we've lost two deals already in the past 30 days because they were going to raise funding and now they can't get it. So really, you have to start thinking about what your stack is going to do. And hopefully it's not going to turn into an apocalypse there. Now, this all being said, I'm very lucky. And so is Greg. We get to talk to a lot of senior marketers, a lot of CMOs, CIOs, CTOs. And there's basically two camps that I'm hearing right now. And this is where it's scary. The first camp, which is all, it's fine. There's a fire going on. I'm okay. Everything is going to be fine. And that's really a big thing that we heard. And when I look at this poll, let's share the poll that we had earlier. And we'll gauge some of the stuff that everybody had, right? These are anonymous, so nobody's data is inside of here. But basically what we're seeing is how has the current crisis impacted you, right? We have 20% of people saying, hey, just being a little more aggressive. We've had to cut back. Most people are like, ah, nothing's changed, right? And that's kind of cool. If you scroll down to number two, right, Q2 is most likely going to be difficult. What about like Q3? And most people are like, they see the recession throughout the year. Some want social distancing. Everything will go back to normal and stabilize. And we can see just in this own webinar how different of camps that we're in, right? 
more than half the people think it's going to be different throughout the year. Some people are going to, of course, make it, they're going to stabilize it. Now, we'll come back to some of these things as we get later in this webinar. I'm going to stop sharing that, but this is some of the things that are really, really interesting. When we look at some of the data that came out from Price, uh, excuse me, ProfitWell, ProfitWell did an index study of all the customers that they have on their subscription services. And if we look at this B2B SaaS, we can see all the way back to January, and then we can basically see the 25th uh, of March. And ultimately, just like most indexes, right, like the Dow Jones or NASDAQ or S&P, right, this is a consortium of all those different companies have it up. I mean, it's kind of up and to the right, right? You see a little dip at the normal time of the year, right? Around the new year, it takes a little bit of a dip. And then you can see we're right at the top here. And it's really, there's really not much. It looks like it's maybe leveling off a little bit, but it's really not all that bad. Now let's look at it like on the consumer side, right? Which is totally crazy. Once again, this is January, 2019, March, 2020. Now the normal stereotypical thing happened, right? The beginning of the year, everybody starts buying stuff. Kids get out of school, kids go on spring break. Summer happens, business slows down, kids go back to school, kids go, so things go back up. And then of course you have the end of the year stuff where people are just buying stuff. And then of course the beginning of the year, subscriptions kick back up. But basically, right before the week before the 25th, everybody started churning their accounts, right? And that's a big deal. And consumer spending is one of the leading indicators of B2B spending. And that's one of the things we have to pay attention to. B2B, we're not feeling it yet because everybody in B2B is trying to figure out how to remote work. Everybody who's a consumer who just lost their job, they're like, I need to cancel my subscriptions. So we have to remember that like, some of these things are interacting with each other, and we're going to see it a little bit later. Now. With this being said, I said I'm hearing two camps. And the next camp is ultimately like, is not fine, right? And that's really right now that B2C camp. The B2B camps, like things hanging out. Luckily, hopefully they haven't been laid off. I know a ton of people have been laid off. Three million people lost their job, which is so sad. And it's that camp that's ultimately freaking out and saying things aren't fine. Now, Greg, I think one, you have a unique perspective of the world. Your tool is integrated in with all these ad networks. You work with all these big brands. I mean, help me understand what you're seeing out of your constituents. Yeah, interestingly, you know, I think, um, you know, in our customer base, we're seeing something similar like you're seeing with the B2C where there's a pretty stark drop, particularly in industries that are non-essential right now, travel and entertainment. Um, and, and I think that's kind of the calm before the storm, whether that where that's going to start affecting the, the broader economy and, and, um, you know, B2C sales and across all these industries start to go down. We also are seeing kind of at a larger level, an interesting transition in the ad tech industry, in the B2B industry for a lot of other major sort of keystone changes that are happening with GDPR and CCPA and the constantly evolving regulatory landscape and what browsers are doing with privacy, what Apple's doing with Safari and what uh, Firefox is doing. Chrome's launching a new privacy sandbox. Um, there's just a, there, it's a wild turbulent time and the, the B2B industry in our internal conversations is particularly the ad tech players are saying this is not fine. They, they don't exactly know who's going to be the king when it comes to identity. They don't exactly know, you know, on a month by month basis, they have different things they're allowed to do, what they're allowed to share. And so much of this complicated ecosystem relies on all these guys speaking the same language across all users, across all browsers. And when there's so many cooks in the kitchen saying what's allowed to be shared and what's not allowed to be shared, there's definitely sort of an apocalyptic feel as everybody's trying to fend for themselves, put up their wall gardens and, and cut up a, a chunk of the, the industry that they can continue to survive in. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see who sort of emerges on top and, and really has good strategic solutions to the, to the industry change. Well, I think it's interesting because like this whole apocalyptic type situation happens like hits the fan and then Apple all of a sudden is like, you know what? We had this plan to get rid of the cookies in like the future, but we're just going to do it now. Do you see this yeah. that happen? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and with this new Google, you know, privacy sandbox is a really interesting one because they're trying to essentially retroactively do what Apple did uh, with mobile when Apple came out and said, look, no longer are we going to use PII and all these complicated ways to identify users. We're going to come up with the ID for advertisers, which is a standard sort of iPhone specific identity that you have that we can all get on board with. And Google's trying to come in and do the same thing with their privacy sandbox and create a web-based 
uh, sort of global identity solution and everybody's trying to take a cut of that pie. There's a lot of competition in that and, and there's sort of the consumer advocacy groups, there's the business advocacy groups, there's the government trying to push things. Um, and yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting battle to see who, who gets to the top. It's going to be crazy. I'll tell you that I'm, I'm almost excited and terrified all at the same time. Yeah. Um, we just put out a blog post at our site about uh, Google's killing the cookie. Um, and it's got it. If you go to our site, go to our blog, it's on the bottom, but it's got the cutest picture of a sad cookie. Honestly, <laughs> even though the post is amazing, I can't stop looking at the cookie because it's so cool. Um, but yeah, no, it's crazy. And I mean, just to kind of tailwind off of that, I mean, I think one of the things that we're really seeing, like as we were listening to ProfitWell and Patrick over at ProfitWell just does such a great job. B2B, of course, is a little bit of a lagging indicator, right? You see B2C spending go down, which is normal consumer. B2B will ultimately fall behind it. But when they looked at the actual growth rate of B2B companies, which I thought was really interesting, is instead of just looking at the number of subscriptions and then seeing if there was churn, what they did was is they had, let's, let's look at this based upon the company's growth and with one being kind of the average or the benchmark of what's happening. And then you can see since the beginning of basically March, it's really started to tank. And what I find really interesting is you're usually going to see these spikes because that's when contracts start is near the end of the month. Um, but what's interesting is you can see that the business world was kind of waking up a little bit to it right at the beginning of the month. Um, I submitted or I put out a big blog post in Google Docs just because I didn't want to put it on our site uh, around 3.8 that basically said like the economy is going to go sideways like now. Um, and since around that time, like you can definitely see that B2B growth is happening. And I think even in one of our businesses, and this is an actual graph from uh, Amplitude, which shows one of my products, UTM.io, for everybody who doesn't know what it is, go check it out. UTM.io is like the campaign management product that helps everybody build the UTMs. But from just looking at our growth, right, we see the very stereotypical growth, like we're growing at a nice pace. November, December, we slow down. Um, everybody slows down in B2B around this time. January's dope, right? February's dope. This is our normal growth rate. Um, and then we come to March and we're just like, we're chopped off a little bit at the knees. So um, we've made some internal changes in our businesses to make sure that we're focusing on that. Um, I mean, we unfortunately let go of two of our engineers that are uh, outsourced um, and we want to make sure that we focus on keeping the business sustained. We're keeping all of our employees. Some of our contractors have to go, but these types of things, I'm not the only one who's seeing this. Um, so like definitely a big deal. Now, with that being said, um, this is a black swan event, right? This is completely unpredictable. This is unforeseen. Um, I don't know if anybody was watching what was going on in China back in the early January time span. Um, I was trying to pay attention. Uh, to what was happening. I found out about it. Um, I did a lot of uh, research on pandemics a long time ago when I was building referral campaigns. But there's nothing you can do, right? And these things come out of nowhere. Next thing you know, you have this black swan that comes in and really kind of changes your world. And everybody has to kind of freak out and adapt. And we saw this happen in the recession last time when we had the, the mortgage bubble burst. Right now, the, the MarTech bubble is not the black swan, right? Like it wasn't going to be something that was a game changer. Um, and affect everybody's life. But because we had this new black swan that came in of this pandemic, where we're all locked inside. I mean, my three boys, my 14 year old, well, 15 now, uh, 15, eight and five are at home. Like I'm, I'm literally battling over internet during the day to use my tools. I have another team member that can't use Salesforce very well because Salesforce is so resource heavy on the internet that their kids are using too much YouTube. So it's like totally screwing their day. And it's interesting because like when you really start to dig into this stuff, uh, I'm reading the book Anti-Fragile, which is by the guy who wrote the book on black swans. Um, there's some really powerful stuff that we can learn about how to be successful, what to do in these things. So for companies out there that are losing their minds, Sequoia Capital put out a great post. You'll notice this is on March 5th, right? Like this was not like we didn't have some inkling that something was going to happen. But if you haven't read this post, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, I know Greg and I have definitely talked about this. Some of my big takeaways, of course, like we're very fortunate that we're cash strong and other companies are having to cut costs because they're really having to build out that runway. I mean, I know companies that have laid off hundreds of people and they're not big companies. Um, so definitely like big thing there. Now, what are some of the things you're seeing, Tim, out of, out of your purview? Or excuse me, Greg, I called you your brother. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think one of the most interesting things to me from this article was essentially nobody ever regrets making fast and decisive adjustments to changing circumstances. You know, it's, it's Darwinian in that, you know, it's not the most intelligent and the strongest that survive. It's the most adaptable. And 
I think that's kind of what we're all about is basically putting the control in your hands to have maximum flexibility so that you're not reliant on this whole changing landscape to support you and to make sure that they're making adjustments as the industry changes, as regulation changes, as you know, the potential revenue and the, the overall capital infused into the system changes. You're sort of in control of the infrastructure. You're sort of in control of who you're integrated with and you have sort of without a ton of overhead and without a, you know, a ton of sort of industry shifting complexity um, inside your business, you can make quick iterative changes and uh, test things and, and make sure that you're sort of maximizing the minimum viable amount that you need to keep your head above water. And I, and I really think that that's powerful. It kind of allows you to account for essentially everything else that's going on um, is, is, is basically if you're, you're in control of the data and you're in control of the integration, you're in control of the MarTech stack, as much as you possibly can be, I think that's where you have the best shot at weathering whatever comes. Yeah, it's interesting because like um, the guy, and I can't remember his name, uh, he wrote the book Black Swan and this guy's like super, super smart. Um, he also wrote a book called Anti-Fragile. For anybody on this call that's never read that book, highly recommend reading it. It's a book that will just change your perspective on life. Um, but I, I saw somebody tweet it out on Twitter um, and it was like, all right, I'll check it out. And I, I run a lot. So I, I decided I'd read it and I, I'm about 75% done in like a week and a half or so. And one of the key things that they said that keeps you from being fragile, which is instead of saying risk, you have people that are anti-fragile and you have people that are fragile. And in this situation, like the restaurant industry, when you can't go outside becomes extremely fragile, right? And you can't mitigate, you can't track that as a risk because like, who the fuck thought you wouldn't be allowed to go outside, right? That's just really, really hard. So, um, in that situation, right, risk would be not enough people, but where you have to figure out is where are all the options I can change? And I think with tools like MetaRounder, one of the reasons why it's so powerful is that you leave your options open. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, but the most expensive part of your marketing technology stack is usually not the tools. It's actually the process of integrating them, adopting them, and then operating them is where the real money is. And if you're like most companies that are setting up the old way, you want to switch tools, you've got to get engineering, you've got to get a, a scrum master, you've got to get all these things, it can take months, and that winds up being where all the cost goes. So like MetaRouter winds up paying for itself because you don't have to pay for engineers to do the process anymore. So either way, we'll come back to that. I definitely think you're correct in the fact that you can you kind of change your options. You need that optionality. Now with this being said though, I think an interesting thing, what we did was looked at Crunchbase's data and they ultimately have the top 20 reasons why uh, companies fail. And some of the most interesting things are, of course, like, or at least some of the least ones is failure to pivot, right? Luckily, most startups, right, we can pivot. Um, people get burned out, didn't use the network, legal challenges, stuff like that. So, like, most of these things aren't the reason why people fail. But if you look at some of the top 10, there's some pretty glaring ones. One of them is, is like, no market need, right? So, if you're a company like, let's just say Groupon, maybe, who is completely dependent upon brick and mortar, their POS system, they've got to be struggling. I mean, companies like um, Toast, right? Toast is another tool or even Open Table. Like when your market goes away because restaurants can't be used, that's one of the reasons why you fail. And then another reason why a lot of companies go out of business would be they ran out of cash. So for companies out there, let's just, let's just pick on Open Table, the big behemoth in the room. Um, Open Table just lost all of their ability to make reservations at restaurants and they are pivoting like crazy. Now, if they weren't so well funded and I think they're publicly traded now, um, if they weren't so big, they could easily run out of cash. So if you think about many of those startups or those cool products you have, and I'll just pick on Mixmax, Mixmax, my favorite emailing tool, like they're probably not going to go out of business. Like they're probably fine. They'll be able to lay off and keep cash, but just imagine they were trying to raise their next round and they only had six months left. And then they couldn't raise that round. Well, that's a big effing problem. Like you've got to make sure that you have enough cash in the bank. And I think one of the things that I found most interesting as I talked about this with my team was the third reason why companies go out of business is not the right team. And as you can see here, you got these two basketball players, right? They're not playing basketball anymore, but you got this scuba diver. He can still go scuba diving. But this is a moment of crisis. And inside of our company alone, at Effin Amazing, and as well as UTM.io, and the National Association of MarTech, this is a moment when you can definitely see that there's hardship between team members. You got one team member freaking out. You got one team member having a good time. You got another team member that's worried about family issues. And that, that, 
juggle there with personalities can be really, really difficult. And that's where, whenever there's a crisis, that's when relationships are really tested. I mean, uh, Greg, I mean, when you think about this, I mean, you guys have been, I've talked to multiple members of your team. You guys are pretty, pretty relaxed. I mean, I think you're a little insulated from the problem compared to some companies. But when you think about like founder dynamic, you've worked at multiple startups now. I mean, when do you think is the most likely time that founders are going to start hating each other? Is it times of success or is it times of failure? <laughs> Probably times of failure. Yeah. Well, they're stressed out. They're losing their freaking mind. And don't get me wrong. Anytime that there's a lot of money on the table, founders hate each other too. Totally. I have definitely, totally hated my founders before. But so this is a, an interesting dynamic where I think a lot of companies are going to wind up. The leadership team is going to separate. One leader is going to be like, I want to double down. Another leader is going to be like, I don't think we should go that way. Yeah, and, and, the, and the, the, the remote culture thing too, as I've just seen, you know, with so many of the partners that we exist in that are a little bit more monolithic, maybe a little bit more old school, some of the bigger tech companies, it's been wild how much of just like a massive catastrophic shift it's been to try to ship to shift to this fully remote culture. Um, and I think, you know, it's hard to estimate what the downstream effect on long-term productivity and um, how quickly they're able to deliver the critical projects that they needed to hit revenue targets. But I think there's going to be sort of lasting ripple effects from the entire world trying to go remote, remote essentially all in one week. Uh, it's going to oh be my God. interesting. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. Were you guys remote before? Or did you guys have an office? We're mostly remote. We, we, we do, we do have a, a few different offices, but um, most, mostly everybody can kind of work remote whenever they want to. So we were fortunate. We were pretty well prepared. Yeah. I was talking about this with my accountant today, going back to the money thing. Uh, I have a great accounting firm, like awesome people, really, really helpful. But we were talking about cash and like the different loans that are out there now from the feds. And they're like, what are the loans? Like you have to put your rent in there. What if, what are you paying rent? I was like, dummy, we don't have rent. We're a completely remote team. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the problems that uh, I heard about from them was they're like, oh, well, that's great. They're like, one of the problems that they're seeing with their clients that have huge offices is not only does their office now have to pay for um, that office that's not being used, they're now also having to foot the bill for all these new subscriptions for all their team members to go online. And some of these HR departments are also seeing issues where people are complaining, well, when are you going to start paying for my Wi-Fi? When are you yeah. going to start paying for me to have an out-of-home office? I need a desk. So yeah. there's now like this humongous problem that's it's, it's this self-fulfilling cycle that now you got team issues. So it's just, it's, it's fascinating to say the least. Now, just to kind of keep, keep moving on a little bit here, of course, like with this, right, stack apocalypse that's going on, there's the coronavirus, you have this crashing economy, you have team members that are being laid off. I mean, 3 million people lost their job, which I am so sad about. If anybody has a friend who's looking for a job, please send them to us. We are hiring. We definitely are looking for really great people. Uh, it's just such a shame. Happy to help out anybody that I can. But like, when you think about all these things, like what's going to happen to your staff, right? Like, how are you ultimately going to be successful? Now, what I want you to do is ultimately think about how many tools you have in your staff and keep this as anonymous as possible. If you just want to throw that into uh, the chat system or the Q&A, I'd love to get an idea of how many tools do you think are in your staff, right? One to five, six to 10, 10 to 20, even 21 plus. And it's always interesting because people are like, oh, I got six tools. And then I check out their site and I'm like, well, you got 36. Like, what are you talking about? They're like, I had no idea that existed. Like, and that's very stereotypical. Uh, very, very common do you see people not have a good idea of how many tools that they have. Uh, so definitely something that you would see. Now, Melanie, thanks so much for that six to 10. So definitely really, really interesting. But I have to beg the question, right? As one of the guys who is known for Stack and has integrated so many freaking tools over the past 20 years, I don't even know. How many tools do you think are in my Stack, right? And whoever is actually able to guess the closest answer in the next 20 seconds in the, in the chat, I'll send you a free copy of my book, uh, Build Cool Sh I'm not promoting it in this webinar, but either way, uh, I'll send you that. Uh, I see some people are already throwing in some really close answers. I'm pretty sure somebody's seen this slide before somewhere else because they got it almost exactly. Uh, so but another five seconds, throw it in that chat system really, really quickly there. And now everybody's trying to like figure out where the hell the chat system is, right? They're like, I wasn't planning on talking anyways. Uh, totally, I can tell people have been in this webinar. Either way, <laughs> how many tools are in my stack? Well, there's 31, and right? There's all these different tools that I use that are very, very independent upon each other. And of course, that are actually running all of my stuff. And I saw Fabian there. Uh, you got it directly on. I think you may have seen one of my decks before. Uh, just shoot me an email, Dan at Amazing, and I'll get you a free copy of my book. 
but I have a lot of tools. Now I'm lucky because certain tools, I don't think are going to go out of business. Like revive old posts. I don't know if that developer is going to keep working on that project. Zapier is not going around. I mean, Q, I don't know what's going to happen with them. I mean, I think they should be fine. Um, I think Zoom, I mean, Zoom's killing it right now, right? Like, I don't think they have anything to worry about. I don't know if Twofer is going to do anything, but there's just a lot of tools which are really going to struggle. Now, with that being said, with the modern stack, right, like things are so interdependent and so hyper integrated that a lot of companies have just piecemealed it together. So they don't have a good integration. They just kind of threw it together. They got Larry over there in product. They got Sally in, in engineering and they got Kevin in marketing. They got this dude, Rick, in sales, and they're all doing different things. And then you got rogue CEOs just throwing sales loft in there. So because of this crazily integrated stack, in many cases, if one tool falls off, basically the entire stack is going to fall apart. So it's like dealing with a little bit of Jenga um, because you just never know exactly what is going to happen. So it's definitely something that is getting a little bit of worrisome is like, hey, which tool am I going to have to worry about next? And which tool is ultimately going to be the domino that takes everybody down? Now, with that being said, even though you might not lose a tool, right? Say you look at your stack, you're like, hey, I got all these great tools, not going to lose anything. Uh, my life's fine. You still have a time of crisis that's going on and you're going to see budget cuts. I don't care what you say. I don't care what business you're in other than health and medical. And even in health and medical, you're going to see budget cuts. They're not going to spend your budget on marketing anymore. They're going to take it by ventilators. If you're in, um, somebody was talking to me about grocery. They're like, well, we're going to have plenty of money. And I'm like, no, they're going to steal your marketing budget and they're going to move it somewhere else. Like you, it's not because your business is booming that you're going to see all, excuse me, all the money in marketing. Now there's some online businesses where you may see that. But once again, like money moves around when there's a crisis. So you have to take that into consideration. Fat is going to be trimmed in the next couple of weeks. Now, this being said, I, I thought this was really interesting for ProfitWell as I looked at their stuff. They talked about the differencing of value excuse me, propositions and how this affinity has changed. And if you look back to March 2019 and look at why people were basically buying things and what was the behavior, if you look at this, 22% of them were looking to make more money, right? They wanted to make money and only 11 to 12% wanted to save you money. And they did that same exact survey now and you can see how much it's flipped. 31.5% of companies, their affinity is now to tools that save them money, not make them money. So when you think about a marketing technology tool, how many marketing technology tools or sales technology tools, Greg, have you ever heard of that, that are out there like we save you money? Or what do they typically say? They're definitely trying to say, we'll, we'll, get, you, we'll get you to make more money. Yeah. Yeah. So that just means that naturally the traffic is not going to be there. And when we go back to UTM.io's example, our job isn't to make you money or save you money. Our job is to help you understand where your money's going and how much money you make back. And even we're seeing a huge decrease uh, in traffic. So definitely something that's really fascinating. Now, of course, there's a lot of budget cuts. Now, uh, Greg, you, of course, see some really interesting stuff. Where have you seen the biggest budget cuts, do you think, so far? Um, that's a good question. Um... I think probably uh, we're seeing it uh, specifically in ad spend probably uh, is we're seeing a lot of people cut back on uh, kind of centralize the, the advertising channels, kind of trying to figure out which of the advertising channels is, is really the getting the highest ROI and essentially make sort of large cuts in other areas. Um, we've seen a lot of sort of uh, data collection stay pretty pretty centralized, but the sort of how many different tools, the variety of tools that things are going out to definitely start to get cut down. And I would say it comes uh, in areas where you see a lot of like duplicative ad spend. So if you're, if you're kind of trying to push against the same audiences and the same uh, creative across various different services, we're seeing people centralize against just one, maybe it's just Google or they're going all in on Facebook or something like that. Yeah. I've seen a lot of ad spends get cut. I mean, I have a client that spends close to a half a million a month and just turn it off in one day. Um, and just we're, we're done. Yeah. So uh, it's crazy to see that happening. And, and I think that obviously changes for everybody. I mean, in the biggest areas that we've seen some of the biggest dips is of course, CRM and analytics are some of the areas where we've seen less affinity. Not that they're cutting the cost of analytics right now. Um, naturally with many analytics platforms, of course, 
with less usage comes a lower automatic price, right? Because they change that depending upon what size you're at. However, the interest in using those tools has go down dramatically. I think uh, when we looked at the Google Trends, it was something like a 15% decrease in searches for analytics products. Um, so that naturally means like, hey, we're not starting new projects right now. So budgets are going to get a little bit trimmed. Um, and I think a lot of tools that are redundant. So as an example, like if you're using HubSpot and you got Intercom, chances are you're going to use HubSpot's chat and get rid of Intercom because it's going to be cheaper in the long run. If you're using HubSpot CRM, but you're using Autopilot as marketing automation, chances are that redundancy is going to get rid of. Some of these best in breed stacks are going to become platform only stacks just because it's cheaper to do it. And then of course with laid off team members, and this is something that was interesting. I got in a debate with somebody. I was like, Salesforce is going to lose a lot of money uh, in this whole thing. They're like, wow, they'll be fine. They're, they're totally enterprise. And I was like, yeah, you say that now, but when uh, a company, humongous company lays off a thousand people, um, and half of those people are in sales, that's 500 seats. Um, and when you think about the government, yeah, they're busy now, but like they're running out of budgets. They can't buy things. And they're still going to have to lay people off. Um, all of the platforms that have seat-based models, they're going to lose heads. And when you aggregate that across all the people, like it's just going to continue to add up, uh, which is definitely. Um, now, with that being said, like let's just look at this as a real case model. This is, this is a stack really quickly that a typical customer may use. Google Tag Manager piping some data and the different marketing automation tools. You got a CRM and you got a bunch of stuff laid over. But as time moves on, you're basically going to see little tools get chopped off because they're not getting value out of it. All of a sudden, they're like, hey, who uses CallRail? And they're, they're like, oh, that guy, Terry, but he left like six weeks ago. So they're like, oh, well, Terry's gone. All right, well, can somebody cut off a uh, call rail? That's what the CFO is literally going to be doing for the next two to three months. And then they're going to ask the question, okay, well, what about this other tool, Kiss Metrics? Like, what happened to them? Oh, well, we don't use them, but we still pay them 500 a month, so they chop them out. And they're like, well, somebody using Zapier? Nope, we're not using, um, that guy left too. Um, what about, oh, wait a second. Wait, oh, wait a second. Um, oh, wait, hold on, guys. We, we just cut $6,000 a month off our budget. Um, okay, well, we deleted all the tools and you're basically going to get asked the question like, okay, are you able to do the same thing? And they're going to say mostly yes, because the people that were there are no longer there. So that's one of the things that we really have to try to take into consideration is that things can change very dynamically. And it's not that I want to prepare you that you should panic or you should freak out, but we do have to be aware that the world is changing and we're in a lockdown in Orlando for the next month. Uh, they're saying in some places for six months, that has an impact and that's gonna affect people. So it's definitely something that you wanna start planning for and mitigating now. Now, even though that there is some badness, what the hell just happened? Speech downloader? Who's trying to download my speech? What the hell was that? It's got a warning on my screen that I got a speech downloader, that was weird. Either way, even though the things are gonna fall apart, there is definitely times that we're gonna rebuild. No matter what, we're gonna to have to rebuild this stuff and we are gonna get another chance. And keeping costs down is gonna be critical to doing that. So when we think about, even though we're like, hey, I'm cool right now, bro, there are gonna be issues that happen later. And we need to make sure that we are doing it in the best way possible moving forward. And I wanna show you a really, really interesting problem that people just don't pay attention to because they have bloated stacks and they have bloated budgets and they just don't think about the problem. When you go to integrate a piece of marketing technology with your website, you basically want to be able to track actions in that tool. So let's just think you got Google Analytics. You want to add it to your website. You add their JavaScript. And then you need to track that somebody signed up. They signed up for an account. They logged in. They added a cart. They purchased something. They did that NPS surveys. These are all actions that we want to track. And if you want to track that in Google Analytics, use their client-side tracking. And guess what? It works with Google Analytics. But it works with nothing else. And then you're like, okay, you know what? Well, these actions are all really, really important. I want to track those with my Facebook ads because I'm spending money on Facebook. So now you got to add the Facebook JavaScript to your website and be able to track that. And you're like, well, wait a second, guys. Like, I need to get this in Mixed Panel because I need user tracking. You're like, okay, I need this in Autopilot so I can do marketing automation. I'm also spending money on PPC. And you know what? We're going to throw in this headless horseman really quick heap and we're going to track it all in there. And what happens is, is every single time you need to track a new action with one of these tools, you have to get another developer to come in and integrate that tool and maybe even integrate all 18 of them. So if I'm looking to change the way that we track our signups, we basically will have to change it in 16 different codes to make sure that it would work with all of your tools. 
And this is a big problem. This is honestly the most expensive problem inside of most companies that they just are ignorant to because they don't think of developers as cost. But if developers should be building product features or being able to build things like uh, things that make money, they probably shouldn't be doing all the integration for marketing. And this is one of the big reasons why I love products like MetaRouter. MetaRouter is able to make it so that you send all of your data to them and then they distribute it to all the tools. So the next time that you need to build your stack, you need to use a CDI. Basically, you send all of your data to it. It then translates that into the right language of those downstream tools. You integrate once, it takes care of the rest. Instead of you spending 150, 300,000, or a million dollars a year on developers that are doing implementation for 25 or 50% of their time, you now get to reduce that down to a fraction of one tenth and be able to deliver much faster. Now, I've been using CDIs for years but I'm gonna turn it to Greg just a little bit to help us understand a little bit about how their product works in this limelight. Yeah, absolutely, thanks. Um, you know, as, like, as the head of product of a CDI, I think, uh, I think I could talk a lot about the various different value propositions of using a CDI, but I do think the, the use case specifically that Dan brought up um, is sort of the ease and reducing the overhead of being able to switch between tools, being able to simplify or add to your stack without a lot of development overhead is really, really important. I think I would go actually a level even deeper than that and say a lot of us, and this is true even in our company, we don't necessarily have a, a tool problem. We have an efficacy problem with the way that we're using those tools and what we're getting out of those tools. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I'm guilty of this all the time. I'll think that a, a particular tool um, doesn't necessarily work for my team. And the truth is I'm just not using it right. I'm not giving it the, the very specific correct inputs that it needs in order to give me the outputs that I'm looking for. And in this ad tech space, it's even more complicated than that because you have to give certain providers the right inputs, the right data and the right shape and the right parameters and the right variables and the right events and the right user information so that they can go out and interface with their partners who interface with their partners to get this whole bidding string to actually get back a value proposition back to you or to get the right personalization information back to your site or to manage audiences and segmentation. And it all starts at you as the one who's collecting the data about your customers and delivering it out into this ad tech ecosystem. And you're the one feeding the money into the system, hoping to get some return out of it. And that's, that's really what we focus on is trying to maximize the efficacy and the utilization of the data going out um, so that you can get the, the greatest return uh, from these tools. And so um, really uh, our goal is to essentially give you control, um, to give you uh, the best possible shot at essentially maintaining the data set in a really specific way so that you have the best ability to be flexible for this impending stackopolis and changes in regulation and security because you best know your use case. You know if you're a company who operates in a space that sometimes has to interface with children and so you have different regulatory things that you have to be concerned about with the data shape. And when you just hand over your data to third party CDIs or hand over your data via like a Google Tag Manager and you just essentially, they take the data, they map it, they send it out, it's a black box. You're kind of exposing yourself to a lot of compliance risk. You're exposing yourself to not having visibility into those black boxes and the insight into how you can structure that data to your best, to, to the best of its ability. So essentially this diagram that's on the screen here, this is sort of our enterprise platform. And as you can see, the first step is essentially collecting data from all of your sources, right? In a, in a really standardized way, like Dan was talking about, a single point of ingestion. And then the key here is that it goes into a first party data ingester, which essentially means that for, in our case, it would be collected from metarouter.io and it actually goes to events.metarouter.io. Instead of going to a third party, it goes to you, which means that ad blockers aren't gonna be concerned about with the collection of this data. Uh, regulatory bodies aren't worried about you sharing different types of data in, with CCPA with third parties because you're collecting it all in-house. And then once it's in-house, that's where things get really powerful because you can on a vendor by vendor by vendor basis these, these library of third party syncs. You can look at each vendor and you can say, this is exactly how I wanna share data with exactly this particular partner to get the maximum efficacy and to maintain the maximum amount of security. And so you may look at like an amplitude and say, 
oh, well, I think we'd really benefit from sending user agent and IP address and email address to Amplitude because I can really build strong segments and understand you know, my product analytics, but maybe I'm not comfortable sharing all that information with Facebook because I don't know exactly what they do with data and they've been in a little bit of hot water with this stuff. So maybe I wanna obfuscate IP address or maybe I wanna drop IP address. When you own the stack, when you own the data, you're the first consumer of that data and you decide exactly when and where and how that data gets disseminated out to everybody else. And we think that that's a really, really important step in preparing for an, an, a constantly evolving industry and constantly evolving regulatory changes and, and, and times when there's recession is that you get to make the decisions before anything goes anywhere. And the one thing I would say is, we, we recognize that not everybody is necessarily at a state where they're ready to take that step um, towards sort of full data control. And there's a, a long journey toward data maturity, particularly in data routing infrastructure like this. And so we do have a, a SaaS product at MetaRouter that allows you to take more steps toward the direction of, of a little bit more control and a little bit more insight into how the data is delivered. And obviously, everything Dan talked about with the heavy simplification of the routing and delivery of that data, but it doesn't require you to manage as much of the infrastructure. Um, and for the next 48 hours, uh, anyone from this webinar uh, who goes to app.metarouter.io and signs up, um, we're going to give them uh, 60 free days. So if you just sign up at app.metarouter and let us know through the chat widget that you came from this webinar, um, you can get uh, 60 days free on that product. That's awesome. Well, thank you very much for doing that. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I think that I think these products have a, a, an immense amount of value and are able to really kind of one, keep you secure, keep you compliant, but as well as be able to make it a lot easier to kind of onboard these tools, work with these tools, keep yourself safe from it. Because I think the biggest, biggest area of risk for most companies is actually the other tools and the way that they manage your data. So uh, just in the essence of time, we're going to keep moving along. I want to make sure that we can leave this open for some Q&A at the end. Um, so I definitely want to talk about like, no matter what, there's going to be winners and losers. And when we ran the poll earlier, it's kind of interesting, right? Whether there's a, a recession or depression, someone is always going to lose money, but others are going to make money. And when we asked this question earlier, uh, if you look at question three uh, on the poll that I just pulled up, basically some of the industries that we thought were going to be winners were, of course, online learning, remote work. That's where some of the big ones are. We can see health and wellness, but not nearly as big. Uh, and then, of course, streaming media. And I, I would totally agree. I mean, YouTube around the entire world is basically running at 480p, right? So because there's just too much load on the servers and too much load on the internet. And then we look at question four, like what industry do you think is going to be the biggest loser? Uh, naturally, we can see that the largest one is, of course, travel and luxury, right? Travel and luxury goods are down. Conferences and trade shows are, of course, down. And food and beverage is down. And then, of course, sports and entertainment is really not uh, as bad. Now, what I think is interesting about all these things, and this is one of the things that we did some work on, you'll notice that software companies are practically not effective, which I think is incorrect. I think that those are a lagging indicator based upon these leading indicators that we have. The interesting thing is that travel is dependent upon conferences and trade shows, food and beverages are, based, are, are dependent upon sports and entertainment, and conferences are, I mean, they're, they're very, very uh, self-reliant, or I shouldn't even say self-reliant, they're very dependent upon each other. Uh, which is really, really interesting, which magnifies the issues um, and just makes it a lot worse. So I definitely find there being some interesting stuff. And when we think about the current crisis that we're in, this is something that came from a company, uh, Hyde Park uh, Venture Partners. Basically, what they did was a six to 12 month breadth of what was going to ultimately be happening. And Columbia University did this and put it out. And basically, if we did nothing, we're going to see this peak control uh, craziness, which they were predicting somewhere in the middle of April. And in Florida, they just told us yesterday they're canceling schools until May 1st, which is like, why send us back to school? We only have 20 days left. But basically, that peak was ultimately saying the middle of April. Now, of course, we're, we're seeing this possibly change. You'll notice that like, hey, a lot of people are going in lockdown, which then extends the peak to where there's some issues uh, kind of around June, right? And if we go under severe measures like some states have been, uh, you'll see that this just continues to get elongated and elongated and elongated. So we do have to take into consideration that this is not a, a, a three-week blip. Um, this is not a, a, a fad, right? This is going to be something that really affects us. And when you think about the amount of pain that's going to happen, it's really interesting. I think Hyde uh, Park did the best job so far that I've seen of kind of explaining this. What you'll notice is these are, of course, the industries across. And you'll notice that green means uh, a 50% increase. Yellow means basically no change. And red means 100% negative. 
Now, what's interesting is, of course, this is healthcare, the industry, and then these are the things inside of that industry which ultimately get purchased. And you'll notice really that like healthcare, of course, you're going to see a pretty big boom. What I thought was interesting, though, is if you look at like things like e-commerce, consumer products going to go up, B2C marketplaces a little bit up, business products, services, not so much, B2B marketplaces. So we're, those are definitely going to see a little bit of a pain, right? Not as many people are looking to buy stuff. Um, SMB status are probably going to see a little bit of an uptick when it comes down to those e-commerce businesses. And then, of course, enterprise SaaS, they're going to still see a little bit of growth in that space. But then you have like grocery, right? They're going to see some increases, but some things are just not going to be able to be predictable. Like we just don't know what's going to happen. But what I find fascinating is if you look at the red, obviously this is a lot of red. Uh, my buddy Lance has a graph that looks like this and we call this the bloodbath area. Um, ultimately finance and insurance, right? If you think about the consumer product, B2C marketplaces, business products and services, B2B marketplaces, they're going to see upwards of a 50% decrease. And then, of course, maybe in the SMB stuff, maybe some enterprise stuff, not as bad, but they're still going to see a slowdown. But when you fast forward a little bit to some of these other industries, like it's really, really tough. Now, I know this is negative, but there's obviously some things that we can do about it, right? One, you can pivot, and you can focus on the right things. So what do you do? Well, you change course and you act now and you be decisive. Um, I heard this great thing from uh, the Gazelle Lab, which is like this entrepreneur thing. And they said, leaders right now need to be able to ask for feedback and be decisive. Do not do, hey, you make the decision, right? You need to be decisive, ask for opinions, and then make a decision and move forward. We don't have time to dick around. We don't have time to make change. And our team, we're lucky. Uh, four weeks ago, we started working on our change plans. Three of us were in San Francisco three weeks ago as a leadership team, redesigning our strategy and actually hitting the nail on the head with what we're going to do. And we already have two weeks, three weeks lead time across a lot of people in regards to turning our battleship left. But like, what do you need to focus on, right? Well, there's five things that you need to look at. And this comes from a company called Topo. Definitely check them out. I have a link to their webinar on here. I'll send it to you afterwards. This is a great webinar. Uh, TopoHQ.com, they're an advisory firm. There's basically five things that you need to look at. One, you need to reanalyze the target markets that you have. So who are you targeting, right? If you're targeting the travel industry, well, hey, dummy, you better turn left and figure out something else. You also need to optimize your cost to acquire a customer, right? Because it's going to become either more expensive or less expensive depending upon where you target. And you really need to start taking that into consideration because good businesses are financially sound. You have to understand that. You also need to remember you need to offer extreme value, right? You have got to be offering something that's unique. Everybody and their mother is doing webinars. And trust me, I can tell by the registration and attendance rate that we see in webinars. We run webinars for other companies. If anybody wants to spin their webinar game up, just shoot me a note, we're happy to help you, but you really have to figure out what that value prop is. And I can tell you this, we have a great value prop in this webinar. The next thing is, is you need to do now. Do not say, we'll, we'll think about this in the middle of April. If you haven't made decisions now, you need to take, do some serious soul searching and make those decisions. And then lastly, the big thing, you need to redesign your organization to make sure that it's prepared for this environment. These are the five most critical things. In my line of work, I predominantly focus on these three things right here. So now we're telling you some high level stuff that you can go do. Go check out this webinar. You can watch it. It'll be really, really helpful for you. But what are the tactics which are going to help you today? Well, one, you need to keep doing email, right? Email is still something that everybody's going to get, if not more of it. So you need to make sure that you're engaging. And going back to that extreme value, you don't be tone deaf, have good emails, and reach out to people for the right reasons. And then on top of that, Text messages, these are another channel that people are gonna use. So use text messages, use phone calls. People want you to be empathetic. Don't be tone deaf and be like, bro, buy my software, right? Because nobody wants to hear that. Ask them if you can lend them a hand and help them out. Something that's gonna be really, really important. And if you aren't used to it by now, get on some webinars and host webinars and get in face-to-face -face meetings. I know this is a new environment for everybody. For me, this is every single day. I've been training for this my entire life. Like I have, I don't even leave my house for a week at a time because I've been working for home, from home for so many years. But these are the tactics that you have to spin up on. You need to be able to get really effing good at email, really effing good at phone conversations and text messages. I win more six-figure deals over text messages than anything else. And webinars are my number one driver of pipeline. And they have been for years. I don't go to conferences. Are you kidding me? I got to spend $15,000 in a sponsorship. I then got to fly there. I got to spend all this downtime. Yeah, I get some face-to-face -face time. I'd rather go hang out with my buddy Lance. I don't even get a booth. I just hang out with Lance and talk to people, right? I do all my stuff via webinar. Way cheaper, way more effective. Now, that being said, 
Listen, I know we've covered a lot. We only have a few minutes for questions. I do have a hard stop because I got this great meeting with this guy, Bob. But I highly recommend for you to take advantage of this free MarTech Action Plan meeting. You'll be able to get on a call with me for 30 minutes. Just go to fnamazing.com slash MarTech Plan. If you go there, you're immediately going to see access to my calendar. You can book a 30-minute meeting with me. We'll go through and we'll build your entire stack. We'll then run through all the costs that you're investing on, what your pandemic mitigation plans need to be. And I'll give you my expert experience and expert advice that I've gained over the past 20 years on what you need to be actually doing today. Thank you very much, everybody. We appreciate you coming out. We definitely want to open it up for some questions. So throw those in the Zoom chat or even in the q and I don't really care. But I did have one question for Greg uh, in regards to some of the stuff that you're seeing is, I think one of the things that's, that's interesting is like, I, going back to our conversation about the cookies, like why did Apple think now was the right idea to move the cookie, right? And go default, like why was now the right time? Is it just Tim Cook's an asshole or like, was there a reason? No, I think, I think a lot of businesses, I mean, I think there's, we kind of hold the line where, you know, we, we appreciate consumer privacy. And I actually think that there's, there is a solution where this whole, ecosystem can work in, in a more anonymous way. I think the idea of it being really important to find out exactly who you are, what street you live on, and what your email address is in order to, to make sure we get strong effectiveness out of our ad campaigns is, is probably dated. I think that um, there will be this is a coming from, Not to interrupt, this is coming from a product guy, right? Not a marketer. You're definitely not a marketer here. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's true. I suppose that's true. But I mean, I, I think I think that I think Apple's doing it now. Truthfully, like the, the reason they're doing it and why Google's trying to capitalize on it is because it it looks good. It's really good for their brand. I think when they 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 don't necessarily need to survive on advertising. They're product guys, and so they can take a chunk of the goodwill from from being an advocate for consumer privacy and consumer rights. Um, and it looks really good and really strong. And they don't necessarily care if that throws off the DSP SSP bidding algorithm or if that screws up personalization or audience building, um, because it's not necessarily how they make their money. Yeah. No. Really. Really interesting. Yeah, no, I find that really, really fascinating. Well, unfortunately, I do have a hard stop and I have to jump into another meeting. So I appreciate everybody making it here. I appreciate everybody making it out. I'll send out a copy of the slides. I'll send out a copy of the recording. Any final words, Greg, before we keep moving? No, it was fun to be here. I hope, uh, I hope everybody stays safe during this coronavirus and that you guys find uh, the right kind of stack for you. I think Dan's a great resource. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully it's a good, good ride on the next six months while we get out of this thing. Absolutely. And if you don't, if you haven't had a chance, please go to app.metarouter.io and tell them in the chat that you came from the webinar and you get hooked up with that 60 days free. But I'll chat with everybody later. Enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe out there. Thanks a lot.